Okay, uh, uh, okay, okay, so if you are wondering what the hell I'm doing is I'm trying to see whether I can do a 1080 stream. Uh, until now I didn't expect that I would be able to do 1080 stream because uh, I thought that if I lower the bitrate it's gonna be, the quality is gonna be crap. Uh, but I'm still trying to see how the quality is affected. So obviously, if I move things around, we can see that uh, everything can scrap, but then it restores again. So even with 600 bitrate, actually, let me try this with uh, 1,200 bitrate. So if I move this to uh, 1,200 bitrate uh, and try this again. Yeah, 1000 bitrate obviously doesn't, uh, it, do it actually doesn't have the artifacts. But I'm gonna keep it for 600 for now and see how it goes. And if you guys have any problem with the quality, uh, we can only boost it later. I, my connection is basically is good enough for 600, for uh, 2000, 2000, up to 2000. But for now, I think the quality is good enough. I don't think the stream has any kind of issues. Uh, it seems that quality wise is good. So we'll see how it goes. Okay, so let's say the stream starts at 7.30. And let's see what we'll be doing now. Okay, so I think the bet rate is pretty good. And we are ready to begin the stream. Yeah, okay. So welcome everybody, welcome to the stream. Uh, we are working with the Voxel tool by Zilan. Uh, for those that don't really know what the Voxel tool, Voxel tool is this amazing thing here, which basically is a module for Godot. This is something compiled with the Godot engine. You can also get binaries. I think they offer binaries of the, uh, or, or together with the. Uh, actually, let me actually do this one and see how the quality is to and stop to the image here. I want to look look at this. Yeah, the quality does fall a bit, but then it restores. So it's only when I move things up and down. Huh? Okay, that's a problem because we're going to be not moving the screen so much. I think it's still good enough. Anyway, uh, so this is basically a tool that allows you to create your own uh, procedural, uh, procedural generate terrain. Uh, it takes something that's defined uh, mathematically and uh, tries to change into uh, something that is... Uh, uh, something that is uh, uh, made out of mesa triangles that you expect to have in most of those things and uh, yeah it's a uh, it's a great way to uh, it's a great way uh, to make procedural terrain ter 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 because i want to make a terrain for planets for solar systems for asteroids for this kind of stuff. And this is basically what it does. It takes a, a, a geometric defined procedurally using its own kind of uh, node graph. It has like a flow graph as we have in materials. Uh, so it allows you to basically define those things using a node graph that is found here. Uh, okay, where is the node graph? Uh, it's this one. Wait, wait, wait where's the node graph? Uh, maybe I have to go this. Yeah, this is a node graph. So this is the node graph. And it's, uh, yeah, it uh, allows you to do uh, the generation you want without any problems. Uh, so, you know what, it, what's, what, I think I will raise this to, let's raise this to 100. Because I see that it struggles a bit. So let me set that to 800. 
Uh, I will play around with the bitrate of this stream. Sorry about that, but I need to find what works best. Uh, and see how it goes from there. So, we'll see. We'll see how it goes. Uh, we're going to play around with the bitrate during the stream, and I will find some quality setting that will make the quality a bit better. Anyway, uh, yeah, so this is how it works. Uh, it allows you to use this kind of visual language that uh, defines uh, the terrain and how you're going to sculpt the terrain. So that's how you sculpt it. You can also write a JD script code if you're not mistaken. You can also can do it in C++ if you want to. So it has a lot of tools. It's a very powerful system for making the procedural terrain. You can also make other procedural messages, like procedural generated messages if you want to. And this is basically something that allows me to create my own planets. So uh, let's see what we're going to have. So in the goal of this, the goal of this stream is to uh, try to uh, read the API reference. So we have actually read, I've read the, let's see what I've read. I've read the, uh, I've read uh, all this section here was basically a tutorial. So how to get a model, restart, overview terrain types, block the terrain, smooth terrain. Smooth terrain is what we're using. The generator is what generates the terrain. The streams is how it stores the terrain. So you can actually do things like sculpt the terrain, etc., and store that in the hard drive. Uh, instances is when you want to add, uh, you know, messes in like uh, uh, trees, if you want to make a forest or rocks, or you want to add enemies on top of the terrain, etc., etc. It has an editor facility, as we always saw. You can do things in the editor. It has a multiplayer, but the multiplayer currently works only for blocky style terrain, which is basically Minecraft, where my terrain is going to be more of the smooth, smooth kind of kind. Uh, then you have, of course, the ability to script it. You can script it using the nodes, as we explained here, the, the graph system that we saw, the visual language. Or you can use GDScript, or you can use also C++ and C Sharp if you want to. Performance, it is fully multi-threaded, which is great. Uh, it allows you to take advantage, uh, full advantage of your GPU. It's not currently uh, available for the GPU. And it allows you, of course, to do your own module development. allows you also to extend uh, the module itself. And yeah, and uh, do all of that. So what we're going to do is go and start by studying uh, the API. So it has a very extensive API, as you can see here. Uh, it has, I don't think I need to zoom it as much as I used to. No, I want it a bit bigger. Uh, because now it's 1080, 1080, you guys can read these uh, things a lot easier. Uh, so it has a very extensive API. Uh, as you can see here, it has a lot of classes and a lot of functionality. And here it has all the formats because it allows you to you know, save the formats in a hard drive and allows you to modify the voxels themselves uh, to generate any kind of message you want. So basically, the idea here is how to create gener procedural generate messages in essence. That's what it does. It allows you to create a procedural generated message. You can create planets, you can create asteroids, you can create rocks, you can create enemies, you can create star bases. Although the algorithms that it uses is not are that precise to allow you to make sharp geometry, so it's usually more useful for things that are bleak blobby, like a like a procedural ter a terrain generation. But you can use it also for enemies, for creatures, and all this kind of stuff. Uh, so you can use something like that, or even for if you want to do something like No Man's Sky, for example. So yeah, we're gonna start with uh, reading the documentation. We're gonna go through everything step by step. So let's start with uh, 1400. Uh, start reading the API reference documentation. And for those that are, you know, they're really curious what I'm doing here, it's basically this is how I add my timestamps. And oh my God, my glasses are horrible. And the timestamps is for those that I want to watch the stream on YouTube and they want to jump around and I want to avoid all this extra talk that sometimes I do, my runs and etc. and focus on the parts that are actually me working and studying and figuring things out. So, without further ado, let's get it started. And the first class, of course, it's Fast Noise Light. Now, Fast Noise Light, uh, for those who don't really know, I think it's, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it's an open source library, a third party open source library called in C++ that also Godot uses. So I don't know if it uses the fast noise of Godot or if it has its own fast noise there. Because I think I also used it in one when I made my own procedural terrain. So using noise for terrain, usually use that if you use something like hate maps. Um, so it usually gives you, ah, it has noise 3D. Okay, so it's also 3D. 
So when the noise is too deep, it basically works like a hit bump. So it works like a bump map. So it goes only up and down. You know, you cannot go left and right. You cannot have caves and all this kind of stuff because you cannot. You can only have hill and valleys. But if the noise is 3D, you can also have caves. You can have uh, you know holes in the ground like excavation because that's important for me. I want to make the ability of the player to excavate the terrain and mine for resources, etc., etc. So this one is takes basically three floats the position of uh, because it samples the noise and it gives you the value of one point in the noise map where here instead of uh, using three different arguments it uses one argument with three values basically vector three which is going to be still xyz so that is the normal thing so yeah this is the open simplex which is usually the standard i think this is something that not a good to use as well you have the perni noise of course FBM is a fractional uh, Brownian motion. This is actually heavily used for terrain. Uh, most noises uh, really depend on fractional uh, Brownian motion because it's basically a semi-random way of generating uh, noise. So the noise is not completely random because if you have completely random no noise, it looks like uh, you know spikes on the on the, on the very rough and spiky terrain, which is, of course you don't really want to have. You want to have something that's a bit more organic, a bit more fluid. And Frank Sooner Boronio Motion does that because it takes this randomness and limits it itself using, using something like a Lanurani, Lanurani or something like that's called. Uh, where is that? I don't think it's, it's fine. See, I don't. Lanucarity. I think something like that's called. I forget the name now. Ah, Lacunarity. So this one basically is defines how much random the noise is going to be. This is the gain, which means uh, how amplified the effect is going to be, so how uh, larger they're going to the hills and the valleys. Um, I don't know about the cellular thing. Uh, octaves is how much detail you want to have, so basically means that uh, you're going to have large hills, but those hills are going to have extra details on top of them, and then those details are going to have details on top of them. So it allows you basically to have something that has a, a general random look but also has a very detailed look as well on top of that it's like layers of details one on top of each other that's what octaves are doing uh fractal type i don't know what exactly this is probably has different types of fractal geometry uh, ge uh, fractal noise uh the period i don't know what that is probably is the frequency if i'm not mistaken and of course the seed if you don't want to have a completely random you want to have a specific random result you can use something like a seed so, okay, so this uh, class makes total sense. Uh, okay, and it has the default values here. Right, so we reset. So basically what I'm going to do in this stream, I'm going to go through the API. And tomorrow we will go and get into the editor and start working uh, with the, you know, the editor stuff in essence. So, yeah. That's about it. I look, I check, like, look at the stream a bit and see I, it does fluctuate a bit for some reason. Let's see how we're doing connection-wise. Frames-wise, we're doing great. Probably I can boost a bit the bitrate a bit more if I want to. Let me let me push the bitrate a bit more. Uh, let's go back up to ah I'm on 800. Eh? Okay, let's go 1,000 bitrate. I didn't realize that was so slow again. Yeah, that's better. That's a bit better. But I see a pul pulsating effect here with the compression. I don't know why it pulsates like this. Anyway. Why it does pulsating like this? Anyway, it is what it is. Uh, okay, let's go back to fast noise and see how it works there. And yeah. Okay. So we finished fast noise, then we had a fast noise light gradient. Okay, I don't know what that is, does, but I, I assume it's a different kind of noise. Probably it, it allows you to go from one type of noise to another, maybe something like that. I see a warp 2D and warp 3D. Okay, 
Then we have the Voxu, which is very important. This is the most important class. So, okay, so a voxel basically is, for those that are new to, this, to the video, it's basically nothing more than a, 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 a piece of, a, a block of space, a, a volume. You, we, this is why we, we call it voxel, it means volume pixel. And we call it a pixel because basically it's a cube, right? Um, so it's like a 3D pixel, but a, a, a large city experience, some size, right? It's not going to be just a, a point in space. Uh, so it has a volume. It has a, you know, a volume by itself. And inside this volume, the mathematical geometry, because it's defined mathematically, again, using uh, the mathematical language here, which basically, it's like the mathematical language we're using when we make a material, right? So you have add, multiply things, subtract things, and all this kind of stuff. In order to create the, uh, the geometry using math. So it takes this math here, and it has to convert that into a mesh. So what it's going to take is going to take the geometry, slice it into voxels, and take every individual voxel and see where the geometry intersects with the voxel. And out of this intersection, will generate a set of faces inside the voxel. If the, the, the surface doesn't intersect with the voxel, it is not going to generate any faces. It will require the voxel to be empty. Now, in this, sometimes it requires, uh, say, it's called an air voxel because basically it's supposed to be just air, right? Because it's supposed to be above the terrain. Uh, but in reality, it's just, uh, usually it's called also a null voxel because it doesn't have any data inside, it's just uh, by itself. So that's how it works. Um, so this voxel is very important because it represents every individual voxel. Usually we have around uh, 4,096 voxels in an area. And as we move the player, of course, the voxels move with us. Uh, so you can imagine that there's a, like a circle around the player, a sphere around the player, you know, with the player being in the center. And inside that sphere, there are 4,096 voxels. And the sphere moves with the player. And every time it has to rec recalculate and regenerate the mess. Uh, so it, it, every voxel, every single frame is going to be different, have different faces inside. So. If this, for example, retains the mesh, this is very important. The mesh is where we care about. This is the most important value, which is going to uh, uh, retain, all, not the entire mesh, but only the mesh that this voxel captures. So it's going to be just a few faces. Uh, a random tickable, I don't know what it is. Transparent index, transparent, when it's transparent, voxel name. I can have a name, all right, it's nice. Get entries, empty, send ID. So if you don't produce any geometry, the voxel will be invisible. So this is one we want to disable the voxel. We can uh, change the geometry type to zero. Uh, this is also generates a cube. So that basically means that it fills the entire volume of the voxel with a cube, with a mesh cube. Well, the geometry cost of mesh is what we want, is uh, use the mesh specified in the mesh property. So this is what we care about. So that means that every voxel uh, creates a, di a different mess. Is it individual mess per voxel, or is it a, a, a mess that is shared by an entire? Probably it's a, a different mess per, per voxel. Okay. Oh. Mm. Um. Side positive X, blah, blah. side positive negative. Blah. So I think by positive X, positive Y it means that uh, what is that? Side negative X, side positive X, negative Y, positive Y. 
Negative z, positive z, side count 6. What is that? No idea. Sign negative x. I think by sign negative x maybe it means the left side. Probably that's that's just something what it means. Up and down, left, right, front, back, up, down, or something. Oh, I think uh, up and down should be actually z is front and uh, back. I think uh, y is up and down. Anyway, I think probably that's what it means. Uh, okay, collision apps. So that's for collision. So the nice thing about those voxels is that they also do physics, which is really nice because it allows you to basically have like a terrain that if you cut it, if you cut the terrain, it can fall to the ground, uh, which is great. If it's like like an overhang, for example, let's say that you have like a rock formation on top of the terrain that uh, sticks out, and you cut that part you cut the base, it's going to fall to the terrain because it has physics. So this model actually gives us a lot of nice stuff when we want to make a procedural terrain. It gives us the physics, it gives us the ability to excavate it, it gives us the ability to um, uh, sculpt it in, in different shapes. And I thought it also has material uh, tools as well. So that is the voxel. Actually, it, I expect to be a lot bigger than that. It's very basic, but that's fine. Let's go to the next one. Voxel block serializer. So the block serializer is basically the one that is uh, probably it uh, stores into memory. Yeah, this is for a voxel buffer. Or to store it to a file. So yeah, as I saw, I will go through all these uh, classes very quickly, uh, the next two hours. So probably not six hours, more likely the next one hour and a half. So I'm not going to go through a lot of detail for every of those classes. I'm just here to just get a uh, general idea what the API is doing. So I know what I'm doing myself as well, uh, because tomorrow we will start playing around with this in the editor and see what kind of terrain we can make. Uh, yeah, and I think it's going to be a very, very interesting week. Because it's going to be very fascinating to see what we can make. We're going to make terrain, populated with trees, with rocks, with enemies. Oh, will really nice. The next few months uh, will be me working on the terrain itself for the game, because I'm making the game. Uh, so, yeah, we go. This is actually something we'll be working on for the next few months, I think. From the looks of it, it looks very good. Unless it has some kind of serious performance issue. Uh, for me, it was more a question from a feature point of view. I felt that do I really need? Does it, I didn't expect to have many features, but apparently this one has a lot of features that I can use. So the next question is performance. I think performance is not going to be a problem because I decided to go with a low poly look. So I don't think performance is going to be an issue there. Even though it's not GPU accelerated, it's still on the CPU should be fast enough. So if you don't have any serious problems with performance, and any serious lack of features, uh, I would say that 99% probably will use this as the basis for my project, for my game. And I will bring out all, a lot of other libraries as well inside. SQLite, by the way, it's a database I will be using for the game, which is also SQLite something that uh, this module is using for the voxel terrain as well. I will be using the dialog system, which uh, the dialog add-on is for God output dialog because they're going to be also RPG elements. So I'm going to be using a lot of third-party tools. Uh, you're going to see me avoiding a lot of coding just using code that other people make as long as it's MIT licensed so I can use it uh, because this is going to be of course a closed source game and maybe I will help contribute in some of those projects I, I, I will mind to contribute some minor fixes I already reported an error uh, with this build uh, there is a, a nice discord here channel I reported the error here and provided them with a fix uh, yesterday uh, it was this one and my fix is also mentioned here and uh, we are waiting now to get the pull request from another person uh, to get this fixed because it wasn't building correctly. So I think, yeah, I think it's not ready yet. Uh, we have to give you a commit to master. Let's see, there's no commit to master yet. Ah, there is a commit to master. Okay, so he actually missed, merged that, which is great because I can go now here into my own. Let me close that, I can open it later. Uh, save and quit, yeah. Okay. 
And where am I now? The status. Oh, wait, what? Why does it change in that Cyclops CPP? What? Cheat diff. Wait, what? There's untracked files. Untracked files? Why there's untracked files? Ah, I didn't add the files. Oh, shit. Ah, I didn't add them. Uh, zip commit am uh, add uh, rename files to correspond correspond with the name of the project for the game engine. Uh... Okay, oh, there's a lot over here. Okay. And this push to... What, 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 what branch are we are? Branch is Voxel. Okay. So, Zit push uh, GitLab. Voxel. Okay. So, let's go now to modules. Let's go to Voxel. And let's do a Zit pull. It's going to pull the latest commit. And let's go outside. Let's go outside. And let's now do a build. SH release. He should build it without any issues. And we don't have to wait for this. We can go back to the documentation. Well, that's pretty fast. That's okay. Let's go back to the documentation and we come back. Come back to this. Okay. So this is very. Wait. What? Uh, no, I don't want that. Yes. Uh, so this is the voxel voxel uh, block of uh, voxel block serializer. Is this for the blocky approach? Which one is that? Okay, I can always come back to this. I don't care. Voxel box mover. What is that? You know? Ah, it's for physics. So it's also for physics. Allows you to move and slide logic. Okay. By the way, I think move and slide has been removed in Godot 4, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, I don't know if you guys know that. But I think it has been removed in Godot 4, the move and slide. I think they have some different thing now uh, with the momentum or... Velocity, something like that. Okay, so this is a physics thing with collisions. Okay. Uh, nice. Let's move to the next one. Voxel buffer. Now, this is important. Uh, this is very important. This contains the dense voxel data storage. Every single cell holds data. There is no sparse optimization of space. Uh, works like a normal 3 degree containing a voxel value in cell, organized in channels, or configured with path. Values can be interpreted in others and signed indicators or normalized floats. See and depth for information. Arbitrary metadata can be stored either for the whole buffer or per voxel or higher cost. This metadata can be get saved and loaded along voxels. However, you must make sure that the data is serializable. Nodes or arbitrary objects. What it means? Arbitrary metadata can also be stored. Basically, arbitrary metadata here means that you make your own custom data with a voxel, which is useful. For example, you want to store a voxel in snow, or you want to store voxel that represents lava. So it would be useful to have some extra data as well, for as metadata. Uh, this method can, can get saved and loaded on long voxels. However, you must make sure the data is ser serializable. Seri serializable. It should not contain nodes or arbitrary objects. I think basically it means that it, it has to use primitive types. 
So like uh, strings or numbers. That's what I, what, what I think it means here. And it shouldn't contain a reference to other objects in memory, which makes sense because those references will change as soon as you load uh, a new scene or you reload the game. Okay, okay, okay. So this is a buffer, right? This is a buffer, okay. So a buffer, basically, for those who don't know, is just nothing more than a piece of memory. It's a raw, a raw piece of memory. So it's not like a variable that has a specific size, etc. A buffer can have any size. So it can be, you know, something you can use for streaming audio or streaming video or, or anything like that. So usually it's used for uh, dumping pieces of data inside a, a file uh, one after the other. So this is important, it's a voxel tool. This is actually a helper class that allows you to do basic uh, functionality on the voxel. Here we can get the voxel that we serialize. And you can get a specific voxel from X, Y, and Z coordinates. This is the coordinates, uh, not in the 3D space, but I think this is the coordinates inside the grid of the voxels, because you have a grid of voxels that contains multiple voxels. And this is the position of the voxel in that grid. So the size of the grid is, of, of course, the size. The size of the, of the grid cells are the size of the voxels, basically. What's the difference between this and this? Ah, this one retains a float, this one retains a need. Okay. Wait, why it returns a need, though, if it says a voxel? Should I return a voxel instead? That I don't understand. Why it returns a need for the voxel? Is that like a list of uh, voxels and returns an index, probably? Maybe? I don't understand this. Uh, we have to look at the documentation. Uh, this is the This is basically what we care about. This DF data is how you make procedural geometry uh, from math. And then uh, you will hear this and refer to as the ISO surface. Uh, OK. This is for color data. Uh, and probably these free channels you can use for other data for yourself. Erase all contents of the buffer and set size to zero. Control. Okay, so this is basically something we will definitely be may work with. Uh, as you can see, these classes and these methods are C++. So it's not clear if those are uh, the same for GDescript side. That's because there's a void here. I think those are C++, if I'm not mistaken. Although I can be mistaken because I don't see any any uh, any e pointers here, which usually there are pointers in C++. Uh, but I, th I don't think this is GDescript. I think this is C++. It's the API in C++ side. But I think the API on the ZDF side, I think it probably is going to be more or less the same. So I don't think it's going to make a difference. Um... Okay, so I copies the voxel data data. Okay. Uh, voxel, get voxel metadata. So we get the metadata here, we define ourselves. The get voxel tool, this is important. We're gonna take a look at this. Uh, so this is for this is a helper class which offers common functionality for voxels. Mm, set the raw value of a voxel. Int value. Okay, so how the value of the voxel? What is the value of the voxel exactly? That is the one thing I don't understand. What exactly is the value of the voxel? What kind of value it stores? Because generally, folks who store multiple values, they store values for every vertex they have. 
which is basically they measure the distance from the actual geometry. So, as you can show, a voxel has six sides, so it has uh, six vertices. No, it has eight vertices. And every of those vertices uh, has a value stored inside of it that tells it uh, how far each side or outside the surface is. And using these values, you can actually predict what kind of faces they're going to be intersecting with the voxel inside, if it intersects with the geometry. So that's how you do it with the uh, uh, cube marching. And I think this is a similar technique that I used for uh, 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 the voxel tool here in Godot doesn't really use it. Uh, it actually has a matching cubes algorithm as well, but they use mostly transvoxel algorithm, which is a bit more flexible and much more powerful, a bit slower. But it's, uh, it has less side effects, like it doesn't have tears in the mess, it doesn't uh, create holes and all this kind of stuff you can get with uh, uh, matching cubes. But I think the method is very similar. So we have to say that what exactly this value is. I will have to find that. Uh, it doesn't really say here what the value is. Maybe it uses one, maybe it's like dual contouring. Dual contouring stores only one value, which is the distance to the surface in one only, because it has only one point. Maybe it's like transvoxel. Let's take a look at the transvoxel. Trans voxel or this is basically what it uses for this module uh, okay let's take a look at this nice everything f nothing failed that's amazing amazing i say so everything builds fine which is great that's its status do i need to still commit yeah uh okay that's fine uh, yeah, let's do a commit. That should be on the safe side. Sit commit am uh, update to the latest commit of voxel tools that doesn't fail on build on compilation. And let's push that to GitLab. Uh, Voxel uh, branch, and we are fine. Okay, that's great. Okay, so let's go back to the documentation. So this is trans transvoxel algorithm. The transvoxel algorithm is a very flexible algorithm for when it comes to generate terrain. Now, this is the tables I was saying uh, earlier on that the uh, matching cube is using, the lookup tables are called. And it solves these problems here. So this is basically the problem you have with, uh, I think this is matching cubes. So you, you have this kind of holes. And the nice thing about transvoxel, uh, B is, ah, this is the matching cubes. Yeah, this is the wireframe frame of the matching cubes. So this is, both of them are the same method as matching cubes. And this is basically the transvoxel method, which doesn't have the stairs. So it's a, a bit more efficient. Yeah, so it's very efficient and you can see, however, from what I've seen, the way they generate the faces are actually very similar. So it's not really, it doesn't look to be as the same dual contouring. It doesn't seem to be close to dual contouring. But yeah, this is, you will see why it's not ideal for making procedural messes because the topology creates, and this is one of the problems with messers in general. Uh, Milk and Banana, I literally just left a comment, checked in, and you are live. What coincidence? Milk and Banana, welcome. Uh, yeah, we left a comment. Where we left a comment? Where you do leave the comment? Let's see. Hmm, I don't see a comment yet. I see a comment that you made earlier on about scats in my stream, but I don't see a comment right now. Uh, but yeah, welcome to the stream. Welcome, welcome. Again, for people that are new to the stream, uh, let me repeat what I'm doing. Uh, I am giving up on anything that has to do with making things from scratch. I go lazy mode, I give up on Python and anything, and I'm focusing on making the game right now. No more wasting around time trying to come up with, uh, uh, you know, learning math and mathematics and all this kind of crazy stuff. 
And I'm trying to, to find the easiest way to make my game, which is going to be already very complex. And I gave up on Python. Now I'm going to do everything on JavaScript. So for those people that uh, wanted to follow this in the JavaScript site, uh, you're going to be very glad to know that uh, I will not be doing a lot of C++ coding. After all, I will be doing mostly JavaScript. And I'm using uh, a module that made by Zilan that's called Transvoxel, which is a great tool that allows you to make procedural, te uh, procedural generate terrain uh, like uh, Minecraft or procedural terrain generate using smooth uh, voxels like this, which is basically what I want. And I will be making a, uh, a low poly game that will use that to make uh, procedural planets and procedural terrain. And maybe just maybe also procedural enemies at some point, but I don't think so. Uh, for now, it's just procedural terrain. And of course, you know, populate this terrain with trees, rocks, and all this kind of stuff. So what I'm doing right now is yesterday I built the uh, I built this module with my engine because I'm making my own engine essentially because I make my own C++ code, and it works well. It works well. It functions correctly. It had a problem that the uh, compilation, but we fixed that, and we make a relative co to fix that. And today I'm studying the API reference. We did the tutorials early in the morning. So I went to the entire tutorial, and now I'm studying the API reference. So I'll go through every class to see what it is doing, because this tool is actually very extensive, very powerful. And yeah, and I'm trying to see how it works on, on, a, on a more low level kind of aspect. So tomorrow we will start making our own terrain and starting making our own planets and asteroids. I replied to reply to your reply on my ah you replied to my reply to my comment oh nice uh, I also didn't get modified when you replied which was weird yeah I also didn't I I'm not uh, also already ah yeah I just got the reply here it is uh, I have been busy with the university and only enough I have been hired for a game in Gordon as an art director wow really hopefully I will have some time to tune in wow man congratulations wow. Game director, wow, game art, art director, nice, very well, well done, well done, congratulations, very exciting stuff, uh, can you talk about the game, uh, if you want to talk about the game, use the chat below, and tell us a bit more details, I, unless you are in, of course on NBA or something, you cannot speak about it, but if you want to talk about the game, please do so, so yeah, that's what I'm doing, I make an appearance, so yes, I am back, and hopefully I will not be going away anytime soon. Uh, the streams will resume as they are. So I'm going to be doing... A, 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 well, now I'm doing both like two-hour stream and two-hour stream, so to get used to it. But I, I hope to go three hour and three hours. So it's going to be two, three-hour streams per day. So total six hours of streaming. Uh, hopefully every day. Apart from this, maybe I will be busy doing something else. It happens from time to time. So yeah, pro uh, hopefully I will be back and uh, we're going to get very fast get going to making the game because I don't want to waste any more time. Yeah, pretty lucky. It was a job hiring that someone is I followed and I say I was interested, saw my portfolio, he agreed to work with me and now I'm working on it for this month. He agreed to work to work with me and now I'm working on it for this month. You might have heard of it, it's Godot Kart Racing. Yeah, I think I heard Godot Kart Racing. Yeah, I think I heard that somewhere. I think I've seen that also in one of the games that make with Godot, Kart Racer. Uh, is this one? I assume. Let's see. Ah, I know this guy. This one was, uh, I think he was one of the, the uh, one of the game dev, one of the uh, developers I've seen one time in, um, uh, what was it? In uh, Blender Game Engine. He used to use he used Blender Game Engine, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, Milk and Banana, here you are. Hmm. Nice. Cool. Do we have anything to show from the game? Is anything really... You guys have anything to show? Oh, here we go. I'm going to remove the music. Sorry for the music, but uh, just to, for the copyright reason. Ah, okay. This is a music track. 
Okay. Uh, I'm not gonna play music because I don't know if YouTube uh, gets crazy about it. Uh, okay, okay. Very great, man. I hope you do great and uh, everything goes well. I know that games are a bit uh, a pain in the ass to make. Uh, yeah, that one. But yeah, working on this one and they used Godot so it was hand experience. They posted a small demo of it on Reddit, but it was very, very documentary. Okay. Yeah, it's still very early on. I understand. I have nothing to show for my game either, so... You can take, you can literally spend months and months and months learning stuff and not do anything. <laughs> That's part of the game development process, yeah. So, right, okay, uh, let's get back to this. So I don't know what this value is doing. Uh, let's go to the next uh, in class then. Voxel color palette, okay. What the hell is that? Color array, what is that? Zero, zero, one, zero, zero. What the hell is that? Color palette. Okay, it's a color palette. Okay. If you say so, whatever. Voxel generate. Now, this is important. Uh, this is how you generate the voxels. That's very simple. Generate block. So block basically is a collection of voxels. Uh, I think it's a, the block has around 4,096 uh, voxels. So you can imagine that's a huge cube that has many small cubes inside. Uh... And you can have also level of detail, yeah, because some cubes will have more voxels, some cubes cubes that have lower detail we're gonna have fewer voxels so depending on how many voxels you have of course you have more detailed more detailed geometry okay let's move on we don't stop for anything we are ready here ah okay we win we win fast that's nice i want this to finish in one hour so in the next one hour we're gonna go through very fast through the classes and see what they're doing so this is voxel generated flat. This is generate basically flat terrain for voxels. It's just a flat thing, and you can use that then to later on to manipulate it to make your own uh, mountains and hills, etc. Uh, I think it's uh, this is basically for flat surfaces mostly. You need the flat surface usually when you want to position a, a ground base. You have like a ground base, and you don't want the terrain to have any uh, hills and valleys inside it because you want to be flat. So the base sits on the flat surface. This is very important. This is the generator graph. Which, by the way, the generator graph is... The generator graph is... The generator graph is... Mm, this one. This is the generator graph. So if I close, if you click on the generator, it opens the graph and you can actually modify it. And you can drive the graph from inside... From inside... Uh, uh, from this side, C++ and GDScript as well. So, what you can do with the graph, you can do a lot of things with the graph. You can add a connection. So, you can do those things also uh, programmatically as well. So, you don't have to use the API here. This is actually useful because it allows you to create, to generate graphs. The graphs here is basically define the terrain. It's basically like materials. It allows you to scalp the terrain with up and kill the valleys. You can create rocks, asteroids, and all this kind of stuff. So you can do this also programmatically. This is very important because you may decide that you want to m make an asteroid that has been uh, uh, dropped in pieces, but you want to make the asteroid uh, uh, cracked in pieces only if the player has mined the asteroid completely. So you want to generate a graph for that, right? It depends on the interaction we have with the user. And you can do that by using the API here. So with the use of this API, basically what you do, instead of having a predefined graph, you create that graph during the execution of the game, which is very useful. Uh, so you can add the connection, which is the connection between the nodes. You can pick a sphere above map. You can connect things as well. What's the difference between this and this? You can clear, you can compile the graph. You can, this compiles to a shader. This is one thing I don't understand. What it says compiles to a shader? Generally, what do you mean by shader? Does it build all that to a shader? Uh, if it, it does to a shader, it's really great. But it says that voxel are not accelerated by the GPU, so it cannot be in a real shader. Unless I'm missing some here. Maybe it means that it doesn't use compute shaders? Probably. 
Well, we see the process. Uh, because there are two, 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 uh, there are two kinds of shaders user can use. There's the fragment shader, which of course generates pixels and textures. There is the vertex shader, which uh, generates, uh, which affects the position of vertices. Uh, there are some other shaders, like geometry shaders, which are not really used that much. And then there's a compute shader, which uh, is a shader that's used for general purpose data, and you can use it for all sorts of things. And usually we use compute shaders more because they're more flexible. But they work basically the same language that the vertex shader and the fragment shader works. So I think by not accelerating the GPU, maybe they mean that they're not using compute shaders uh, for this module. But it may be possible that he already uses uh, fragment shaders or vector shaders or somehow. We'll see. We'll see in the process. I've seen a thing. I've seen an example later on, but we have to see it. Uh, uh, see it again. Probably we'll have to go through the tutorials uh, for the tutorials here one more time. Uh, not everyone, just the ones that interest me. Uh, but for now, I'm gonna stick with the API reference. Uh, so it has a nice debugging information here. Analyzed rates. This actually gives us the possible values that the nodes can take. So the maximum and maximum values. Minimum position and maximum position. Uh, you can Microsoft percent. Oh, this is a profiler. It measures how fast it, it takes to generate a voxel. I like that. I like this a lot. This is actually very important for making sure we calculate how fast the voxel generation is. GUI position. What is that? Ah, this is the GUI position. Must be the position inside the canvas. Oh, so you can even rearrange the, uh, the nodes inside the canvas in here. So you can uh, position them using code. Nice. So you can even generate very clean looking uh, node graphs. Very nice. I like that. Okay, okay. Uh... So here we have all the nodes. Yes, the node types, which is quite a lot of nodes, as you can see. There's SDF sphere, box. So sphere is basically what I'm going to be using for planets, because uh, plants are spheres. Uh, and the reason behind that is because you want to, when the spaceship uh, leaves the planet, leaves the surface, you want, of course, to to see the curvature of the planet actually start in form. So having to use a sphere is important. Now, I went with the idea that I will be using uh, smaller planets. I'm not going to go for a full planet size. I'm not going to aim for Elite Dangerous or a Star Season kind of approach. Or even No Man's Sky. I think No Man's Sky also has very large planets. Uh, instead, I'm going to go for planets that have very small radius, up to 12 kilometers. Uh, because I do some math and I find out that even a 12 kilometer sphere is more than large enough to have tons of po uh, you know, points of interest, at, uh, ground bases, enemies, and uh, you know, places to visit. So making planets that are really, really small has the advantage that you don't have to worry about the math behind it because math gets a lot more complicated when you use uh, very large values. Uh, so yeah, I would like to avoid that. Uh, let me see something because I see here. Wait, what? I see here uh, that there is a bit of a problem with the connection. I don't want that. So far, things have been going very well. Actually, let me take a look at the connection. How well it's going? Uh, no, it has been perfect. It has been going 30 frames per second for the entire stream. Nice. Okay, so we have the torus. You can ha even have a plant made as a torus, as a donut. So you can have a donor planet if you want to, which is great. Uh, so you can actually come up with a great set. And the nice thing about HDFs is that they uh, work as booleans. Uh, what? So the nice thing about HDFs is that they work like booleans. And is uh, that's uh, and that is great because the stream is fine. Okay, that's great to know. Uh, as because I'm playing around with the bitrate, uh, I want to make sure that everything is uh, rendering fine. I also previewed here for myself. So far, it means to be looks good. So what you can do with the SDFs, because I have already done SDFs. And let me actually show you what I've done with SDFs. Uh, I've done a tutorial on SDF, uh, how to make SDFs, etc. Uh, let's see if I can find it. Uh, your channel. So if you go to my channel, uh, and you go, no, we go to tutorials, go to tutorials. There's one I made for... Where 
is the one I made about the ring? I, I, I think it was in the tutorial. I think it was... Um, yeah, it was... Uh, uh, what was the one with the ray marcher? Uh, let's see, a uh, ray marching. Kilon. Gold dot. Yeah, I think it was... It wasn't this one that made the... The cold... Yeah, it would be difficult to find now. So anyway, you, the thing you can do with SDFs uh, is that you can combine them like booleans. So you can uh, uh, subtract them, etc. Which basically means you can make a, a planet made looking like a, a stick figure. You can make a planet looking like a, a pyramid. So you can really do a lot of things with SDFs and you can be very flexible. Uh, one example that you can see what you can do with SDFs is Seder Toy, uh, which I made a tutorial for it, how to port Seder Toy rendering eggs, exactly. So let me give you an example here, what you can do with SDFs. And what this is doing, basically, the voxel is they take these SDFs, which are pure mathematical, and turn them into a mess. So, for example, let me give you the rows here, and let's go with the most popular ones. And... Okay, so this one, for example, is pure SDFs. This one is pure SDFs. As you can see, this one here is pure SDF. And you can see it has trees, has... Basically, this is what I'm aiming to do here. So all this is SDF. This is not that a user voxelizer. It's 100% render per pixel. So it has its own rendering algorithm. Uh, what the voxelizer is doing is taking this and turning it into a mesh with the triangles. Because this one doesn't have triangles. It's just a pure math. And you cast the rays of light on, into it and just render every pixel separately. Uh, so this is an example of NSDF. Uh, another example of an SDF is, of course, this one. We have elevated terrain here. Uh, where's the other pages? There's one that I really like. This one also is SDFs. So you can generate this and use a voxelizer on that. Look at this. It's very nice. So a nice uh, snail. And you can have like a shape of the plant being like that. So basically, you can do those things. Here, of course, uses a shader to do those things, but we can do those things using the language here. So we can have something like this, made using these arguments, and it generates the geometry using voxelization. So, what are SDFs? So, SDFs is source for science distance fields. Uh, what a science distance field is, it's very simple. It's a set of values that tells you how far you are from the surface. From the SDF answers one question. How far, if I take a point in 3D space, how far is this point from the surface of an object? Now, how you define this object? You define this object using math. You're using basically algorithms, right? You use mathematical functions. And the simplest way to define a sphere using SDFs is saying x squared plus y squared plus z squared minus the radius. This is always going to give you the distance of uh, a point x, y, and z if we assume the sphere is in the center from its surface. Because in the end of the day, when you know the radius of a sphere, you know exactly what the surface is. Because the surface is always uh, the equal distance of the radius from the center of the sphere. So basically, SDF basically allows you to define geometry using mathematics. And you combine this geometry, making complex shapes. So this is basically an SDF sphere combined with an SDF cylinder, combined with another sphere here, combined with another cylinder. And you use math to then to curve the cylinder. You use math to... If you have done geometry nodes in Blender, if you've done geometry nodes in Blender, if you have watched any tutorial geometry nodes in Blender, Blender is basically using SDFs. Anything you see that it uses uh, procedural geometry uh, or procedural terrain is using SDFs. So it's basically a mathematical way to, de to describe procedural geometry, to tell you the truth. So it's like procedural geometry. Yes, exactly. That's exactly what it is. Usually SDFs are used for procedural geometry, but SDFs can be used for other things as well. Because SDFs gives you not only the shape of things, it can give you also... When you know the shape, you know how to light things. So for example, in Godot, uh, Godot 4 uses SDFs to do global elimination. Because when he uses SDFs to understand the geometry, can understand how the light is going to go and how you're going to have global illumination. So, for example, Godot is using SDFs for global illumination. 
uh, Unreal and Unity using SDFs for ambient inclusion, which is another way to do, because SDF gives you a very easy way to calculate normals, and when you can calculate normals, you can calculate ambient inclusion, you can calculate normal maps, you can calculate uh, cavity uh, maps, uh, you can calculate uh, global elimination. It gives you a lot of extra stuff. The disadvantage of SDFs is that they tend to be a bit expensive, but they are very accurate. So generally speaking, uh, SDFs were, uh, have been around for a long time, since the 80s, but nobody has been using them because they are very expensive, because you have to calculate every point of space to find the distance to that point of space. And nowadays we use them more and more because they're expensive, but they're not that expensive. Uh, and uh, GP modern GPUs nowadays can do quite a wide variety of mathematics that SDFs are doing usually. So you don't have to worry, you don't have to deal with polygons and all this kind of stuff. So already you are using SDFs, if you're using God of War, you're using SDFs. If you're using Unreal or Unity, you're already using SDFs. And there's a lot of uh, effects you can use. Uh, for example, you can do SDFs, you can do fluids. They are very good for using uh, them as fluids. You can use it also for clouds, which is something that a lot of people in lot 3D applications are using SDFs for. Uh, let me find an example of a cloud, which I really like very, very much. Uh, right, so here is an example of an SDF terrain. You can see how it morphs, etc. This is all doing using SDFs and during math. Even the animation is using SDFs. So it defines the geometry in 3D and does the animation using sine waves, etc. So, yeah. You can do pretty flexible stuff with it. So yeah, this is all is procedure generated, everything. There's no, in this one, no, nothing. Even the, this model here, this character, is not a 3D mesh. It's actually, there's no polygons here. All those is pixels. And the SDF basically tells you how to render those pixels. Uh, so there's no polygons here. There's nothing. There's no mesh. There's nothing. There's just the pixels and uh, mathematics. Uh, which, of course, make it more expensive, but also much more flexible. Let's see, where is the one with the clouds that I really liked? Uh, which I like to actually use. Now, this one. This Actually, I love this one. Look at this. I don't know how it's going to render. Now, this is going to test the bitrate. Uh, let's take a look. Yeah, this one is great. So, this one is using... Ah, it, it renders pretty well. It renders pretty well. Of course, the bitrate is a bit low, but it's fine. So you can see how beautiful those clouds are. And if you actually go to the page, uh, let me actually put that into the chat so you can, guys can visit it. Uh, this is the link to it. You guys can click on it. Uh, it runs completely on the on the, on the web. By the way, this is not video. Uh, this is run inside the browser. It's completed. It's real-time rendering. It renders everything real-time. So basically what it has defined here, it's on render engine, basically. And this is using SDFs. This also is SDFs. So SDFs can be used also for things like smokes, like clouds. So in, in this case, I would like to make a game that allows you to go inside clouds and inside gas, plan gas giant planets. That's one of the dreams of mine. I don't know if I'm uh, able to achieve it, uh, because obviously this is going to be quite expensive. Uh, and I don't know how performant is the voxel tools are, but you could use voxel tools even for generating smoke and fire and fluids and weird magic effects, etc. So you can use that uh, for those things as well by using, again, uh, the language here to generate those things. So yeah, it's pretty flexible. We're going to do those things uh, step by step. Uh, it's going to be very interesting. Uh, yeah, it's going to be a lot of fun. But yeah, as you can see here, the math is quite extensive, right? This is uh, It's not a lot of lines of code. It's like 140, li 45 lines of code. You can take this inside Godot and use it as a shader. Uh, all you have to do is go to my YouTube channel and go to uh, my channel, which is Kilon Alios, which, by the way, let me link in here. And you can go to the tutorial of, uh, what was it? How to import a, a shader from shader toy. So I have made this tutorial here. Let me link that also on the chat, which basically shows you how to take any shader from Shader Toy, because Shader Toy has thousands of shaders, and you can change that and, uh, and turn to a fragment shader inside Godot, and you can have that as a texture on any surface you want. 
If you make also the surface uh, semi-trans uh, semi-transparent, it's gonna render like it's a real thing inside the 3D scene. So you can do something like that, make it appear like this. Because anything that's black, it will turn it to transparent. Uh, so yeah, you can take this and put it inside your game, have it like in the background, for example, and render a real time. And uh, yeah, and you can have that as a shader and have this nice effect if you want to. So yeah, you can do quite a lot of crazy stuff with shaders. Shaders is uh, very flexible, obviously. So yeah, just make sure that you check my video. It's only 20 minutes long. And it's going to take you all the bit to the to, uh, take you by hand and show you how you can do those things and add a lot of uh, fancy effects. There's also a, a, a Godot Shaders website. Uh, if you don't if you want if you don't want to, to convert uh, Shaders to from a Shader toy to uh, to Godot Shaders, you can directly go here and here you're going to find tons of Shaders. They are not as powerful. But they're pretty cool. For example, this is a nice outline shader, which I really like. Uh, which is going to give you the fragment shader directly. You copy paste that directly onto Godot shaders. And you don't have to change anything. Uh, which is a bit easier than uh, modifying shader from shader toy. And he has quite a lot of nice shaders here. Uh, let's see. Ah, ah, they, ah, they ported the shaders. Ah, nice. They ported the shaders to... Ah, the port shader is there. Ah, let's try that, actually. Well, I'm not going to try because I'm going to take a bit of time. But yeah, this is the, the shader for the Protein Clouds. So you can actually try this inside Godot if you want to. Let me link that as well. So you can take this code, copy-paste it inside the Fragment shader, inside Godot, and uh, you can use that for a 2D game or 3D game or whatever you want. Nice. Okay, so let's go back to reading the documentation. Okay, what am I reading right now? I'm reading... Wow, the graph, okay, the graph, okay. So you can file. That's a hate map, hate map, height, height map, height. You can use also a mid but for it uh, as a height map, height map, height, height map. Okay. Noise. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 2D.
How many class I have? Hmm. Waves. I need to go a bit faster, huh? Yeah, I'm gonna speed up things a bit. Because it will take me forever to take a look at every class. Yeah, the vox voxel instance, the generator is basically what you use for uh, trees, for uh, rocks, anything that is populated on top of the surface, of the procedural surface. And I think the, the, the idea here is that you, if you want to have physics uh, using that, uh, yeah. Uh, the necessary formats to spawn instances on top of a voxel surface. What's that? Voxel library, okay. So this is basically, Voxel library is basically if you want to have different instance objects and you want to have them together. For say, basically a library of objects like trees, rocks, etc. Voxel letter, now this is one is the important thing. This is what creates the smooth terrain we want. Uh, collision letter, collision mountain, load count, very important. Load distance, you can define here the load distance, how far you want things to render load fade generation it has also the ability to fade things so they don't pop out suddenly so you have uh, this fading effect is used by no man's sky i think uh which is pretty cool so you don't have things that uh suddenly uh, pop out of nowhere uh yeah okay Let's take a look at the bitrate. The bitrate is pretty good from what I've seen. Uh, how much is it? It's 1000. Okay, I will keep it at 1000. I think it's pretty good. Uh, and take a look also on Twitch Inspector. Yeah, the streaming is pretty good. Okay, that's fine. Uh, 
Oh, that's fine. Uh, what I was? Uh, got lost a bit. Okay, so I'm back. Uh, Debug, oh, nice. Dapa scene. There's a lot of light debugging. I, I love debugging first stuff because it gives you a lot of information for when things go wrong, which I absolutely love. So. Again, I'm trying to get a general idea for the PI. I'm not trying to memorize everything here. It's just uh, there's too much information for me to memorize. I'm just trying to get a rough idea how the uh, the voxel tools works internally. We have to put those things into practice, you know, of course, you know, to understand them, how they work. But for now, I just get it uh, just in one uh, look, just to have uh, a bit more comfortable, be more comfortable when I start testing things. Uh, Princess TF top down. Yeah, it doesn't seem to have a, document, a lot of documentation for this. Actually, let's remove that because it can slow things down. Why doesn't load the page? <coughs> Voxel Messer. Yeah, this is very important. This is the mess. This is basically the one that actually uh, generates the mess and generates the mess data that uh, produced uh, after the voxels are mapped. Uh, build mess. Uh, so this returns a mess. This is very important because we can go and then uh, take that mess and co uh, continue to modify, but now we don't modify the mathematical part of the voxel, but the mess data which basically will modify directly the vertices and the edges and the faces. Uh, it's pretty cool. The nice thing is that the voxelizer does something similar that uh, uh, the Nomad Sky is doing. In Nomad Sky, the way they make the creatures, I don't know if you guys know that, the way they make creatures is that they already have messes and they have make a, 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 an algorithm that allows to uh, uh, glue those messes together. So you can take a, a head from one mess and exchange it with a head from another mess, and you can you know be, make a bit a, a random array, a random leg or a random uh, tail, and make a, a random creature out of that. The entire creature is not randomized. Only the uh, which part you pick is randomized, and those parts are glued together, and they're designed in such a way to have. Uh, a set of skeletons they're using for animation, and they're also designed to work very well in terms of texturing. Uh, this is some of the tools that Voxel tool has, which is really great. You can use it not just for terrain generation, but you can use it also for taking existing models, mesh models, and voxelize them. And you voxelize them in case you want to combine them together, because you cannot just combine a mesh together. Of course, it's, gonna, uh, it's not going to fit the topology. But if you use a voxelizer, uh, this is what we call in Blender automatic retopology. If you go to the Blender Emesser, which does automatic retopology, you will see there is an option there that says Voxel. And exactly that is what it does here with the Voxel tool design. It has a Voxelizer that takes a mess, disregards the topology, takes only the, uh, creates a mathematical uh, approximation of the mess, and then it uses this Voxelization Messer, uh, which, uh, you know, voxel messer, which basically turns it into a mess. So we can do something like this inside Godot, and we can generate messes. We can take existing messes, a head or a tail or a foot, and combine them differently together to come up with different kinds of enemies. And uh, even the animation is going to work out because uh, you can use the voxel for doing the animation as well, to an extent. So I don't know how extensive that is. Uh, but it can be useful in B. I mean, I don't, I don't think I will be using it, but I may use it uh, for making a randomized enemies in essence. So, uh, yeah, we'll see. So this is not just for terrain. Uh, right now, I'm more interested in terrain, but uh, yeah, I, th I think that you can use that also for creatures. You can use uh, this voxelizer for vehicles because uh, you can use that also for making a vehicle like a starship. You can use this for making um, animation, smoke, fire, and all this kind of stuff. So yeah, you can make a no, no Man's Sky inside Godot uh, using something. It's not going to be as fast. It's not going to be as detailed. It's not going to be as flexible. It's not going to look as good. 
But uh, it can be. It can be some approximation of that. I always wanted to make some kind of procedural creature concept in a game. Yeah, exactly. You can do that, yeah. You can do that with this kind of tool. It makes makes it a lot easier. And you can do that using only these nodes here. That's, that's all you have to do, just make the nodes. And if you have the nodes from Blender Geometry nodes, you can actually take a ge Blender Geometry node tutorial and you can actually convert it to this one. It's going to be very similar because the, the concepts are exactly the same almost. Uh, geometry nodes in Blender also use SDFs. So you can take the hundreds and hundreds of models that people nowadays make with geometry nodes. If you go to geometry nodes Blender, you're going to see amazing people think, making amazing things. Uh, you know, let me give you some examples. So if you go here and you go geometry, geometry nodes blender. Uh, I don't want a tutorial, I want uh, look at this. For example, let's say you do something like fracture. Look at this. You can fracture tentacles, you can make tentacles. It will look cool. Look at this. Look, look, look at this guy doing. Look at this what he's doing there. He uses curves to make uh, tentacles using SDFs and procedural nodes. That is the power. That is the power of SDFs and, and, and voxelizer. This is easy. It can be easily done by voxelizer, right? Look at this. Yeah, it's great. Amazing, huh? It looks great. And of course, yeah, you, it uses the node system there to start making. You see, it starts with a simple cylinder. It's starting uh, morphing the cylinder using curves. Uh, and then it keeps adding basic shapes with booleans and combines those things to, together. So basically what we see here with geometry nodes is exactly the same thing we see here. It's not any different, right? You have the same, um, the same kind of tools here as well. And you can also do the same thing uh, using the voxel tool, which is why it's, this, is, this is such a powerful tool to use for my game. Now, I'm not going to be doing something like that because I think these things, are, if you do them in real time, are pretty expensive. Uh, even with uh, No Man's Sky, No Man's Sky gener uh, generates those messes before you land on the planet. So every time you go to the loading screen, or when you go uh, switch a star system in No Man's Sky, you have uh, this big loading time. And the reason there's a big loading time is because it generates all the messes for the creatures and the plants before you visit the system. Because if you do that in real time, it's going to be pretty slow. Obviously, uh, it's not the performance is not really quite there yet. So you can break bake that. We say I like break. So this is one of the great things about Voxel Tool in Godot as well is that it allows you to store these things into a mess and then store that mess uh, as a voxel uh, as a voxel uh, array into a file and then load that file later on without having to do the recalculation again. So we can do that as well. So we can generate the mess, store the mess into a file, and then load the mess later on if the player revisits the planet, which is what you do usually with Thomas Kai. It doesn't really, I don't think it really generates everything from scratch. If you visit an existing planet, uh, probably it will just load the mess that you already stored. Uh, it probably will not store everything because you can visit thousands of planets, of course. Geometry nodes are wild, man. Yeah, geometry nodes are crazy. You can do crazy stuff with them. And this is all, you know, simple, combining simple shapes together, and you can create those things. Um, I've seen some other crazy stuff. Uh, okay, this is procedural terrain. So you can make uh, flowers and plants, of course. Fractals are crazy. I love fractals. And I want to do something similar to my game with fractals. Uh, let's see if... Uh, look at this. That's great, man. Actually, wait, 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 wait. Why it's... Uh... Look at this. Come on. My internet is suffering. Look at this. Look at this beauty. Yeah, the bitrate is pretty crap, of course. You cannot see much. But yeah, you get the idea. You get the idea. You get the idea. 
And you can also make buildings as well, which I like. Look at this building. Is it crazy? You can do so, so many things with uh, with Geometry Nose. So flexible and so powerful. So we can do those things inside Godot as well with using this something like this. Uh, because all those things are based using very simple tools, very simple shapes. Uh, you don't use you, you don't need to use something like Blender to do this kind of thing. You can do those things in Godot inside, uh, and you can do them of course real time uh, as well. Uh, but you have to be careful of course how you design things because you know it can take a lot of performance. But yeah, you can do quite great stuff. Uh, I love this guy's tunnel. Yeah, I am I'm also sucker for anything that has to do with procedural generation, shaders, etc. I love that. So, how much time we have? 30 minutes, okay, let's move on. Cubes, that's for Minecraft, thanks. Okay, we'll move on. Messer, this is the matching cubes, which we are not gonna be using. We're gonna be using Transvoxel. So that is, I think this is not really heavily used inside. Uh, it's pretty much primitive. This is what we use, the Transvoxel Messer. Um, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. So this one's a voxel node. What's the difference with the voxel? Voxel node. What's the difference with the voxel node? What is a voxel node and a voxel? What is the, I think voxel probably is a data. Voxel node is a node representation inside Godot. Yeah, probably that because it's associated with several generator, messer, and stream. Okay. Voxel raycast result. Right, so you can do raycasting with voxels. Great, amazing. Move on. Yeah, the, the classes are not that it's pretty small, the class. Most of the classes are pretty small. So where we are now? Okay, we're going. Oh, we get into the, the end. Nice. Voxel server. Okay. So this is for threading and voxels. Nice. And now we go to voxel stream. Now this is important class. Because this one is actually st streams, which basically means it saves things on into the hard drive and load things from the hard drive. Okay. Immerse block. Get block size, get username, immerse block. So what is that? Uh, it doesn't say. So buffer, block blocks of so could save, so long as maybe you cannot keep reference to that data afterwards because items are allowed to case it and save data events faster present the other snapshots. What else happens to the data after the phone is tried? Emerge of those power origin in voxels, origin in voxels, and load. Emerge block. What's the difference between emerge and emerge block? Uh, we don't have documentation here. There's an emerge block and there's emerge block. What is the difference? First of all, emerge seems. What's the difference? Is this for loading or this for saving? Probably. That's one. I think there's one of those for saving and one for loading. I don't know why it says it emerge and doesn't say save block and load block. It would be a lot easier. I will have to ask the Discord. We can always go to Discord and ask me a question, so it's not a problem. It's pretty active, actually. Usually, there's quite a lot of uh, people here. So there's also a Discord for this uh, module and has uh, different uh, channels for different features of the voxel. So this one for smooth voxels is we'll be using mostly. Now you can see here an example of uh, using an existing mesh to make a voxelized version of it. Uh, obviously it's not perfect, as you can see it has artifacts, uh, but it's still a work in progress. So he, Zilan is working on making a voxelizer for existing mesh as well, which is pretty great. Uh, this is a work in progress, of course. Uh... And of course, the, the reason why it has problems here with the eyes, if you see the eyes are looking pretty really weird. The reason behind that is because I think in Suzanne Blender has overlapping uh, faces. So that's not good for SDFs. You need a very clean uh, topology for an SDF to work on top of an existing mess. Uh, otherwise, they're going to be overlaps also in the SDF and they're going to try to do some merging, which is pretty weird. So this is why you get that weird artifacts. 
because otherwise if you can see the rest of the module is pretty fine now the, the the ears here are weird because there's not enough uh, probably resolution for voxel probably we need a bit more resolution but overall it's pretty good uh you know it, it's getting there it's still a work in progress obviously and this is basically another example that actually let's, do, let's see that into here youtube uh, So this is another example of doing that using existing meshes and stamping those meshes. Uh, oh, the quality is crap. Okay, let's say the quality. And you're trying to stamp those meshes on the terrain. Look, look at what happens. It's very nice. It's very well done, actually. So you use the, the mesh as a brush and you can actually stamp that on the terrain. Which really shows you the kind of resolution you can have. So it's not a bad resolution. As you can see, it's not very precise. So it's not for very sharp edges and very sharp objects. But I think you can solve that by adding a bit more resolution to the voxel. Of course, you're going to have a lot of messes, you're going to have a lot more polygons. But you can use pretty crazy stuff with it, as you can see. And that's how you can make weird planets with weird shapes, you know, weird uh, geometries, etc. Which I really like. So yeah, quite a lot of flexibility there. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> what the fuck is this in the middle? Yeah, this is very important for me, SQLite. Uh, this is a very powerful database where I highly recommend to people to use. Uh, if you do anything database-wise in inside a game, make sure to use this. It's already there is a SQL model for Godot, and SQLite basically is a SQL, the usual SQL that people use professionally for databases. It's very flexible, very powerful, can allow you to combine data, merge data, slice data, split data, all sorts of things. Uh, and very fast, very performant, uh, very reliable, uh, very complicated if you want to be complex. It can be simple if you want to be simple, if you want to be complex. So it has its own language called uh, uh, SQL, SQL. SQL. Um, and this one is a light version, basically means that you don't need a server or a complex infrastructure to have that. This is meant to work on a single file basis. And SQLite is a library for SQL that is very light in a single file. Uh, you can use it as single player games. And already it's used by Godot, it's used by Python. Python is by standard, uh, comes included with uh, SQL. And there's also a Godot module, a Godot Adona thing that uh, has a port of SQL for Godot, and also is used here for Voxel tool, uh, to store for storing uh, Voxels. So this is very impo important because it allows us to do a lot of flexible and powerful stuff with data uh, that we had to implement all those things using Go GDescript or using C++, which of course is a waste of time. Um, and yeah, and if we want to search, to, one of the things I love about SQL is uh, it has a very powerful way to search data. So if you want to search data, like you do in Google Search, for example, uh, using something SQL makes the perfect sense if you have a lot, a lot of data. So, yeah, that also is very nice. But it doesn't also say anything. What is the, how you access the SQL data? Into them. So it you actually gives you the file, the SQL file, basically. Okay. Right. That's fine. Voxel stream script. I think this one is for uh, uh, writing your own script for storing the data in the hard drive into a file. Buffer in which to populate the data. Uh, okay, so emerge is for loading. And uh, Emerge is for saving. I have no, no idea why they make it like that. It makes no sense. It's actually called Save Block, uh, Load Block, and Save Block. I don't know why they chose this name. Kind of weird.
But, you know, nothing is perfect. Uh, custom level detail. So this is Voxel. We are not going to be using this. We were using Voxel Low Terrain. This one is the most simpler one, which I think is for blocky shapes. Uh, but I think this one is inherited by Low Terrain. So maybe it's useful to look at some of the... Uh, no, it doesn't have a lot of methods. Okay. Now, the next one is very important. Voxel tools usually access, use, we use it for accessing uh, voxels and having a basic functionality. So let's go to the next one, which I actually I want to take a look, a deeper look into. Uh, okay. So an abstract interface to access and edit voxels. This is very useful because it allows us to edit voxels individually, which is great. Uh, it allows us basically to edit the shapes, to edit the terrain, to edit you know anything we create with voxels. Um, which is great. Okay. So you copy things to point to box to box. Okay, let's take a look at the methods. Uh... Now, why doesn't document the methods? So you have a get voxel and copy paste. What is paste? Set voxel. What do you mean by setting the voxel? So maybe I have to take a look at the trans voxel algorithm a bit to see how it works to have you a better idea. But eh, currently, it doesn't really matter that much. I probably will do some of the tutorials. Okay, get fault set voxel. Uh, is there editable but set the butter data? Do sphere. What the hell is a do sphere? So do sphere must be like do box. So basically, test of text in a box, a box uh, area, it takes a sphere, a spherical area. Okay. Let's move on. Buffer, nothing. Let's move on. Level tool, load terrain. Uh, what it has? Within a box. Voxel viewer is basically what we use for viewing the voxel from a camera. So if you can see, you can see that I have a camera and has a voxel viewer on, on and assigned to it. This is the only way that generates the voxel visually. Otherwise, without this, you're not going to be able to see any voxels. By the way. If you wonder why the hell there are no voxels here, uh, I think the reason being that I... Uh, why does it generate... What was, what was the last time I generated a mess here? I don't remember. Uh, did that change something? To remember how we did that. No. Stream? Ah, I don't care about the stream here. So this is SDF, that's correct. So why it doesn't generate? 
Is it because I'm using... Uh... Wait, 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 wait. Transvoxel. None. Wait, wait, wait. Where's the... Where's the graph? Uh, I forgot how to do that. Uh, let me think. Vox terrain, right? Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. How did I do that? No, I think it's here where we put the Voxel generator. I'm very. Maybe it was a graph. Yeah, here's a graph. But I think it was a noise that I used. Why? It doesn't say. Where's the terrain? Ah, noise is empty. Okay. Uh, fast noise. Uh, no, I think I did it simplest. Smooth. Yes. Okay, you can regenerate. Oh, here it is. Okay. So that's how the voxelizer works. As you can see, it creates this kind of milky thing, but you can limit that by, let me see, by limiting the height here to 80. Last time we did that, we have to regenerate terrain. And you can get a bit more terrain. So if I go here and open that and use this, you can see I'm still getting some kind of milky kind of thing, but it looks more like a terrain now. So that's how you do it using a simple noise. But we will be using probably graph to generate what we want. And the reason why it wasn't generating early on because the graph was very simple. It wasn't doing anything. Uh, so yeah, this is basically an example of how you can use uh, the voxel tool to create your own terrain. I did see some kind of patches though here. There are some patches here. Why? Ah, it can be because I have uh, the camera in the center. Mm. Because I have the camera in the center, it shows some patches. I can see them here as well. So there will be some way to, to solve that. So yeah, this is what we're going to be doing tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow, I will be coming back and starting playing around with this and trying to come up with uh, the terrain generation. Uh, today we finish with the API reference, I will be finishing in a few minutes and tomorrow morning I will be starting working with the terrain generator to see what I can actually come up with and play around with the tools I have. So, let's go back to the documentation and finish this. So what we have uh, remaining? Ah, we almost finished. Uh, voxel tool, tool terrain, and then we have the voxel, uh, voxel, voxel loader. I'm going through very fast through the formats as well, and then the stream there. Uh, this is, uh, we will know where to load blocks around them. Okay, it's the voxel viewer. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, so this is probably attached to the camera. And then there is the voxel, voxel loader, which does what? It loads voxels from a file. Okay. What's the difference with the streamer? The streamer is, is the streamer doing the thing? I don't know. So okay, let's go with the block file format. Okay, so it compresses the data of the block. So it's a compressed file format. So this is the file formats that are used for storing the voxels. Uh, this is the first file format, the version two, version three. Uh, LZT algorithm. I think the LZ, if I'm not making the LZT algorithm is the one that's used by 7zip. It's uh, one of the best algorithms you can use for uh, compression. Is it that? And I think it's 7zip if I'm not mistaken. Use that. Uh, I think it's one of the ones that used by. I'm not, I make a mistake in there. I think it's used by 7zip for. Uh, it's a much, it's much more powerful than uh, the zip file format. Okay, so this data is compressed, that's fine. It kind of makes sense because if you store a lot of voxels, you can 
consume uh, a lot of uh, data, a lot of uh, space, a lot of uh, hard drive, because the data can get very fast. Very, you know, mostly for research generation terrain, you can get a huge amount of terrain with a uh, hundreds of gigabytes of data. So you you have to compress it at some point. It depends, of course, how much you store of it, because you you can not store everything. You can store only the ones that the, the, the pieces only the, the player visits most often for acceleration reasons. Okay. Okay, let's forge some two. Okay, so this is basically the format that stores the voxels. I'm not gonna go through this very in detail because I don't really care. I probably will not mess around with the file format. I will let the voxel tool load its own files, so I'm not gonna mess with this uh, format. Okay, let's compress to the inner. No idea what that is, so we move on. Instance format. What is that? Instance block format. Okay, the most recent version we want, which is uh, version one. Is it that? Uh, yeah. So, so it's the same format, basically with uh, little Lillian. Okay. Then we have the region format, which I think it's uh, the block format. Which is for entire uh, regions of voxels. Okay. Version 3. And SQLite form. Uh, okay, so we finished the documentation. Uh, I will end the stream here. I think we've done enough. Uh, tomorrow we'll come back and we'll start working on this. Uh, I already have started working on it. Uh, we start generating the terrain and playing around with using the terrain. Uh, thanks everyone for joining. Thanks for Milk and Banana for being here and everybody else. Uh, let's see who we can find to raid right now. Uh, Okay, let me see. Uh, let's go Twitch. Who is online right now? So we have Jackie Codes, which is online. Ryzy. Oh, we have uh, pe uh, plenty of people. Okay, so let's uh, take a look at Bros and let's do Godot. Who is doing Godot right now? I think uh, Ryzy is doing Godot, if I'm not mistaken. Ah, oh, I can, and Jackie does go out. Okay, so... Let's go with the Ryze this time, because I read it uh, Jackie a few days ago. So I'm gonna go with the Ryze. Uh, okay, so let's start the raid. Uh... Raid... What? Ria Z. Ria Z. E. Okay, here we go. So, okay, so let's do the message. Uh, have a good, nice and rest. Yeah, too, you too, man. Uh, damn, so many new people doing Godot uh, streams. Yeah, there are actually a lot of people. That's true. And uh, quite a lot of viewers as well. I see three viewers, three viewers, four, seven, 26, 76. Godot is getting popular, guys. Godon is getting a lot more popular. Uh, so yeah, that's very. Uh, it makes me very happy to see more and more people join those streams, and I see Godot approves. And we haven't even released Godot 4 yet. Imagine what's going to happen if Godot 4 releases and everybody starts making really amazing projects with it. I think Godot is going to explode in popularity when it comes to Twitch streaming very very soon. Uh, I think in the next few years 
it's gonna be pretty crazy for Godot. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential there. So yeah, uh, thanks everyone for joining. Uh, let me uh, take a visit on ride. Uh, we're gonna be coming tomorrow. Uh, I will be online uh, at around uh, 12 o'clock for my time, which is basically UTC uh, 10 o'clock, I think. Yeah, it's 10 o'clock UTC. Uh, so yeah, 10 o'clock in the morning for universal time. Uh, so yeah, see you guys then. Hopefully, if you are awake. Uh, otherwise, you're gonna go. You can catch also the second stream, which is around uh, 12 UTC. Uh, sorry, no, uh, 2 UTC. Universal time. So this is basically my streams. You can also show, see them also on my channel. Thanks everyone for joining, and see you guys in the next stream. Bye bye.